ticking time bomb in the sense of global financial systems. The Western leaders to go unchallenged escaped any prosecution and many gained from it financially. More alignment between USA and China would to be after the election year. I would argue that here in China people do a far better job of that. Is get yourself prepared mentally because it could be challenging. When I started making uh, YouTube videos, it was to learn a, a new skill and take that skill into maybe a future semi-retirement. Nothing against golf or anything like that, but I just couldn't see myself playing golf. I think I am built a little bit differently. If you aim to be something you are not, you will always fail. Aim to be you. Aim to look and act and think like you. My interests at the time when I started the channel were travel, tech, politics and finance. And I couldn't really work out a focus or a niche as to say. Hence why I called the channel For All Life's Adventures. A little bit of a stupid name and in itself does not exactly encourage the idea of niching down. But I'm still searching out my main theme, I guess. And I'm in no real hurry to niche down because this is really just a hobby. One main consistency has been that I live and I work in China, as you can see. Uh, so that adds a little bit of different flavor on the interesting things that I share with you. With that lived experience, I've always been keeping an open mind to the impressive expansion of China and the impact that that has and will have on geopolitics in the way of finance, travel, and also tech, including the political atmosphere, which at the moment, I guess, is a little bit stretching. So from a geopolitical viewpoint, I can see now that the Western governments don't want to give way to China's rise and in turn share the world stage and influence. In effect, the Western hegemony that has lasted since the breakup of the Soviet Union has allowed the Western leaders to go unchallenged and that has probably allowed them the freedom to roam, control and assert their belief systems onto many other regions and countries. I would argue that this has been costly to us all in the sense of financial costs, loss of life costs and opportunity costs and I personally have never seen the sense in fighting many of the wars that we have fought over the last 25 years, especially if the war is construed to allow an increase in spend with and profit for companies and entities that can gain the most from a set of actions and policies from the government that result in more warfare and more money for them. Call me cynical. This year, 2024, is the biggest year ever for people voting at the polling stations across what we call the democratic world, say that with these things. And from that, we may see leadership changes that could exasperate the tension. Even in the run up to the big election at the end of the year, the American presidential election in November, we will no doubt see and hear more rhetoric on war, conflict and aggression aimed at many countries with China being on the receiving end of a large part of that. That should worry us all because things could escalate and I'm hoping that after the voting's all done and as we head into the year 2025, we could see cooler heads prevail, more alignment between USA and China and many more countries all working together to help advance civilization. Call me an old hippie, but then I don't quite have the head of hair for that image. I say this because one of the biggest threats we face is not only from war or from the devastation that we might be doing to the planet, but I believe we face a ticking time bomb in the global financial system. The United States federal government's total public debt has reached $34 trillion. That's roughly $101,000 in debt for every single person who lives in the United States. I'm not sure how we would get out of that one this time around. What I do know, the way we got out of the last financial meltdown in 2008 was working together, and that included working with all countries. Even if the actions taken in 2008 were not palatable for the many, myself included, given that most people that caused the problem at the top end escaped any prosecution and many gained from it financially, at least the initial catastrophe was averted or in essence, kicked further down the road. And this brings me to my point here. 
we are sitting on a massive debt bubble that is going to get worse and worse if we do not correct the course and trend that we are on. At some point, this debt is going to have to be addressed and it's likely to be after the election year, which is 2024 this year. That's why I'm talking about 2025 being a big year for um, financial challenges, not just for China, but also for the fact for everyone, including you. But after all that I've said, I honestly do not have the answer for you. But what I can share is what I teach my two grown up children. I talk to them about the following. I say, number one, have some ready cash and avoid debt if you can. Number two, save money from your pay, even if it is just a small amount, it builds up and it also grows that mindset of saving money. Three, understand and protect your portfolio. And by that, I mean your house, pension, and any investments that you might be lucky to have. Number four, get your mind ready and prepare for turmoil because it could have an emotional impact on you, me or anyone, because you could lose your job. The other thing I tell them is to enjoy their life, but spend your money wisely and go for quality and value over the volume. My daughter is very spendthrift and is often selling on her clothes or buying something in the sale, changing it and then reselling it on the for extra money. Incidentally, the UK has brought out a new tax system and with new rules, that means that she has to declare that little bit of money that she makes from doing just that. I don't know how I feel about this, to be honest, especially when you see so many of the rich escape paying taxes and that abuse of government spending that we see in Westminster and beyond. So they're chasing the small amount of money that people can make on a little bit of side hustle. Part of the reason for mentioning this topic is one of the biggest cultural differences that I have found between Asia, in fact China, and the West. And that's how people approach the subject of money, saving money, and managing their personal finances. I would argue that here in China, people do a far better job of that, definitely compared to us in the West. And this for me is one area where we could definitely learn from, even if it means swallowing our pride and taking some action as we look at how China Chinese people manage their personal finances. I would say, look and learn. Chinese households save more than the households in the West. And the facts actually back that up. For example, according to the World Bank, as of 2022, China's gross household savings rate is around 46%, significantly higher than the United States, which is 17%, and the UK, which is as low as 13%. In 2023, a survey by a leading financial institution in China indicated that the average Chinese household saves roughly 30% of its disposable income. And widely available data reveals that China has a much lower credit card usage rate compared to the US and the UK, for instance, where the use of credit cards and credit card debt is closing in on crippling people's financial viability. Chinese households tend to save more than people in the West for many reasons. This is widely known in economic circles and was very supportive during the last financial crisis where China actually bought up a lot of the debts. The reasons for Chinese people saving more are often historical, cultural and economic and the government policy is also supportive of saving money in the sense of higher interest rates. It is cold where I am right now, so I'm going to go and find somewhere a little bit warmer to discuss the rest of this with you. So I found a place which is just a little bit warmer. Anyway, as I was saying, historically periods of economic instability in China have really instilled a sort of sense of financial caution with memories or historical memories of times like the Cultural Revolution and economic reforms, they've built up a mindset of saving for unforeseen circumstances. I have found that the Chinese culture is surprisingly money focused and you do see that more at this time of year as we approach the New Year celebrations, the Chinese New Year celebrations. At this time of the year in China and in Asia, people gift each other packets of money, hard cash, and they wish each other more wealth for the following year, the following lunar year, the Chinese New Year.
the Chinese culture also places a significant emphasis on the family as a unit and intergenerational financial support is a big part of that. Saving money is, is often seen as a way to ensure a stable financial future for the whole family, in fact a stable future for the whole family as a unit. This for me is a, a, is a contrast with the Western cultures and values where individualism and immediate gratification may take precedence over long-term financial planning and in the West children will often leave the family unit once they're grown and will be left to grow wealth on their own unless again it's the upper class who do focus on and pass on generational wealth with tax benefit. Penny dropped yet on that one. Chinese parents often prioritise their children's education, viewing it as a key to upward mobility and again to benefit the future of the family unit. This is seen as a value to the whole family and drives significant saving effort to fund future educational expenses. Meanwhile, in the West, access and desire for education is kind of looked at differently these days and this impacts the need and the urgency for saving for that that educational future. Social pressures and community expectations also play a role in financial behaviours in China. The concept of what they call face is, is crucial and is crucial in maintaining a certain financial standing that contributes to a person or a family's social status. I often describe face as a kind of respect but it's much deeper than that and it's, it's a hard thing for Westerners to understand this and I often have screwed up around that concept of giving people face. In China, people openly discuss their finances and don't be surprised if you are in China and you're here for a, any period of time if someone asks how much you earn. In Western cultures, financial discussions are just, they're just not there and people don't discuss openly their financial situation. And we would run a mile if someone asked you how much you earn or what's your personal financial situation, which I think really is a big mistake because we could actually help each other understand and learn more about money. In fact, we should be taught that at school. There are a number of other factors that explain the differences in saving habits in China compared to the, to the West. Economic structures, welfare safety nets vary between China and the West. Many households, especially in rural areas, um, they save because they don't have a lot of access to financial resources and, and credit. This along with a, an, a well bedded in cultural aversion to debt leads to increased reliance on personal savings. Social welfare system is less developed compared to the West and this lack of robust safety net also encourages families to save as a precaution against unforeseen circumstances. They save for a rainy day. Government policies historically have also incentivised this idea of saving. For example, policies that encourage saving for retirement, home purchases where it's much higher the down payment or higher bank interest rates uh, in general here in China encourage people to, to save and that, and that is all contributing to this a higher saving rate in China compared to the West. So, in conclusion, I would suggest that we are in for a few rocky years. 2024 is the year of the election. Uh, 2025, I would suggest that we are possibly looking at a financial meltdown. So what I would suggest to you is get yourself prepared mentally because it could be challenging and also financially. And if you've got some workable knowledge, share it with other people, share it with your local community, friends and family, because I do think we as humans human beings, we do like to look after each other, especially in that community, so please do that. And as always, that's what I would encourage. This is me, Ian, here in Beijing, saying to you, look after yourself, your family, and your community. And as always, take care. Peace out.